Hey, my name's Alex and I'm the pastor of X Church. Thanks so much for taking time to listen or watch this talk today. I hope it encourages and inspires you on your journey of experiencing and extending God's love. If you like what you hear, you can go to xchurch.com and get more information about our church and ministry. And you can even donate to support what we're doing here in Baldwin and beyond. If you are local to the area, please join us in person for one of our X gatherings. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. in our storefront location we call the space located inside the Claymont Shopping Center. Thanks so much. Here's the message. So we're in a series called The Jesus Life, and we're looking at the Gospel of John. It was written by, anybody? Good job. That was not a trick question, but some of you hesitated there. And John was a follower of Jesus. He lived with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He did ministry with Jesus. And he wrote this gospel, okay, this book about Jesus's life. And he tells you why he wrote it in John 20, beginning in verse 30. And it's not only the reason he wrote it, but it's also the reason why I believe we should go through it together in this collection of talks. So here it is. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So he's saying that Jesus did a lot of things. He goes, I can't write them all down, but what I did write down, I wrote down for this reason. Ready? But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name, that you may have life in his name. Now, this is more than just breath in your lungs, right? What does it mean to have life in his name? The Jesus life. What is it, right? Well, Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or abundantly, okay? He wants us to live a better life. So here is the positional statement for the entire series. It's our understanding, our definition of the Jesus life. Here it is. Ready? It's when I trade my grind for his grace. One more time. It's when I trade my grind for his grace. What is the grind? It's when we find our worth in what we can do in our work, right? It's when we think that we can earn the favor of God and that we have to earn the respect and love of those around us and that we are only as valuable as our output, right? How many of you would say that you struggle to fight the grind? Anybody? Come on. We struggle. Because while our culture on one hand says we're enough, on the other hand, they don't always really mean it, do they? At the end of the day, it's what you do. And and so there are lots of religions. There are lots of teachings surrounding God, the Bible, and even Jesus that say, if you do these things, He will love you. He will save you. He will keep you. But that is not the gospel. Does anybody remember what the word gospel means? Anybody know? Good news. I don't know about you, but if I said I have good news, you need to work the rest of your life to try to earn God's favor. How many of you would think that that's good news? Right? And yet that's kind of what we do, both literally and sometimes Maybe not in a literal way, but we feel it, right? It's the, it's the pressure that's put on us. But when we trade in that grind for grace, everything changes. What is grace? It's when we stop finding our worth in our work and we start finding our worth in his word, who he says we are. And in Ephesians chapter two, beginning in verse eight, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved. That word grace is the unearned undeserved love and favor of God. He says, the writer there, Paul, says that it's not by works so that you can't take credit for this, right? It's nothing that you did to earn God's salvation. And then he goes on to say that you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, right? I grew up learning it to do good works. That's 
the way a lot of the modern translations will render that passage. But in the old King James version, it says unto. And I think that that changes it a little bit because it's not something that I need to wake up and think about always, but now it gets to just be the overflow of my life. Because I am a workmanship, because I am chosen, because I am loved, because God forgives me, because God doesn't care what I did yesterday or what I'm gonna do tomorrow and that he's got my back, I will want to and will do these things he's called me to. Doesn't mean it's always gonna be easy, okay? but it's who you are now, and that is grace, amen? And and so in the intro, we unpacked those two words and those two ideas, and then last week in part one, we jumped into chapter one of John, and we learned that in the fullness of Jesus, who Jesus was, there is grace upon grace, or another way of saying it is there's grace on top of grace. What's it mean, right? What's it mean to experience grace on top of grace? Because throughout this journey through the Gospel of John, we not only want to look at what Jesus taught, but we want to look at who he was and what he did. And he embodied grace. It says he was full of grace and truth. And so we basically learned how to take that grace that we've received and give it to other people, right? How many of you love to receive grace from God? Like you're all about that, yeah? How many of you find it harder to give that same grace to other people? Come on. So that's what we talked about last week. So today, we're going to jump into John chapter 2. I'm not going to give you the title of the part just yet because I want to read this passage first. And I'll tell you what, I've been reading through the Gospel of John for my own self. Okay, I wasn't planning on doing this. It wasn't going to be a series. It just kind of happened that way. And I've been marking up my Bible. I've got one of those awesome multicolored pens. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, Jesus will meet you if you have one of those multicolored pens. And I have just decorated my Bible, okay? And it's so aesthetically pleasing. Um, But I get nervous because I am very um, anal. Um, And so, to use that term, and um, I'm always nervous that I'm going to mess up a page and then I'll have to go get a new Bible because I won't be able to look at it. It's why I still don't have a tattoo yet because I just don't trust another person enough yet to mark my body, okay? Otherwise, I'd have some. I'm just telling you, okay? I had a friend once, he and his wife got a tattoo that said no regrets and then it didn't work out. And so it's awkward. And so like, that's the kind of stuff that runs through my mind, right? Just saying, right? I mean, it happens. Okay, so anyways, getting back to the text. So I've been reading through the Gospel of John and this passage I've read probably several times at least. I won't put a number on it. And I've always kind of glossed over it. It didn't really land um, for me the last several times I, 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 I put my eyes on it. But, but this last time when I read it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Has that ever happened? You're like, I've read this before, but I didn't notice that before, right? And, and so I want to read, it's in John chapter two. Some things have transpired since we last learned about Jesus being full of grace and truth, okay? Um, he actually performed his first recorded miracle. He turned water into wine, okay, right? And they all said amen to that. And then in John chapter two, here's what it says, ready? Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So Jesus is at the Passover. What's that mean? Jesus is a Jew, okay? And he is with Jewish people. The Jews were God's chosen people from the Old Testament, right? They were God's chosen people. And they would, they would celebrate the Passover together. Okay, it was a religious Jewish holiday. And so he was with his people. And it says, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. This is exciting, right? These are his, these are his people that he's come to rescue and save. And they're believing in him as they see him do these works. That's great. But then watch this, because I never got this, okay? But Jesus, on his part did not entrust himself to them. What? Because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Part two today is called On His Part. On His Part. So here is Jesus teaching, doing signs and miracles, amongst his people. They're believing. That's exciting. They want to follow him. But it says on his part, he did not entrust himself to them. You know what that tells me? Jesus set a boundary. 
And he said, I love that you guys are following me and believing in me. But you're not people that I can fully give myself to. Doesn't mean you're necessarily bad people, but I know your hearts. I know your hearts. It says, I know all people. So maybe some of them were just flighty. You ever had a friend that was flighty? They'd kind of come into your life and they'd be there and then they'd leave for a little bit and come back. It's not that they're a bad person. They're just not like a super consistent person. They don't mean to be that way, but it's kind of hard to trust them. Maybe some of them were flighty. Maybe some of them were fighty, you know? You ever have a fighty friend? Come on. A spidey friend. That's a whole other thing. Okay. I don't know about that. Anyways, the point is that he knew that these were people he could not trust. He set a boundary. Now, listen, I did not want to teach this message because boundaries can be a really good thing, but they can also be a dangerous thing. So here's what I've noticed, and I tell this to people um, because I'm pastoring a lot of different generations, and sometimes they don't see it that way. Like my dad will say, I don't see those generational things the way that you do. And I said, well, my generation in particular, millennials, we believe that we're special, so we really need to understand ourselves, okay? And then, of course, understand everybody else as well so we can understand what makes us then, therefore, special. And so what I've noticed is this, okay? Like, let's take um, paternity leave, right? So you tell somebody that's like my dad's age or, you know, um, Mel's age as an example, and you say, hey, you know, yeah, I'm going to take some paternity leave. They go, paternity leave? I don't know her. Like, you know what I mean? Who is she, right? <laughs> I don't know her, okay? But, but, then, but then you talk to a millennial, and they're like, yeah, I'm taking six weeks of paid paternity leave, and then I need five contiguous mental health days, and then I need um, two weeks to, you know, find myself abroad. And again, I want my employer to pay for all of this, okay? And then when I come back, I'd like to ease back into work because there's trauma if I start, you know, back into a full, you know, 40-hour work week because I've been used to not working for the last two months. Amen. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. So, so here's the problem, right? So here's the problem, so here's the problem. Those are both extremes, right? Like there are two extremes. The person who, the, 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 the person who doesn't know how to take the break and doesn't appreciate the break, okay? And these are stereotypes, of course, okay? Um, and then the person who leans into the boundaries and the breaks and then want all the breaks, okay? Am I making any sense? Okay, so somewhere in the middle, there's gotta be a way to set boundaries that's biblical and, and, and healthy, um, but here's the deal, okay? Here's the thing we need to understand. I think the problem is our culture, especially my generation and underneath, views boundaries as a right, not as a gift. One more time, as a right instead of a gift. Let me read a quote that I think sums up the world's current view on boundaries. Ready? Here it is. Love yourself enough to set boundaries. Your time and energy are precious, and do you get to decide how to use them? You teach people how to treat you by deciding what you will and won't accept. Hopefully, I don't have to explain to you why this is not consistent with the gospel and the Bible, but in case you don't know, I will, okay? It's not about you. Okay, but that also doesn't mean that you stomp on yourself and you don't give yourself rest. Making sense? Um, your time and energy are precious, but you are not your own. You belong to God. And it says that he is your life, Colossians 3. And that in Galatians 2, when you believe in Jesus, you have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. And this life, I live in the flesh. It says, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I am his, which means sometimes I'm gonna to have to give up what I want to serve somebody else because that's what he wants from me. But there's gotta be a boundary because if you're like me and you're the guy who thinks he's worthless if he doesn't put in 65 hours a week and you feel like you need to earn respect of those around you, 
because you know, the common understanding is, oh, you, you work on Sundays, right? And then you just hang out the rest of the week. No, not really. But I would sign up for that. Is that what you're, is that what you think you're paying me to do? Because I'll do that. If that's what you think that, I mean, that's fine, but right. So how do we find that balance? Well, what if we understood that it was a gift? Because I'm in that older category. I might be a millennial, but I'm that other guy, right? Um, I'm the guy who works and works and works and feels guilty to take a break. How many of you would be like, yeah, that's me. I, I feel guilty to take a break. Yeah. So, 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 so then what did I mean earlier when I said there's a difference between making it a right and a gift? It's the difference between understanding that I'm not entitled to this, but that it's a gift of God's grace. Because remember, the whole theme is grace, right? And what if we looked at boundaries as grace? Because Jesus is saying, hey, I came to earth. We learned this last week, right? And the word of God, the nickname word for Jesus, right? That's his nickname. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became a human being. And you know what he realized? Well, he already knew this, but he he experienced it. We have limitations and you will work yourself ragged trying to earn the approval of everybody around you. Stop wearing your busyness like a badge of honor because Jesus actually says, no, listen, Matthew 11, here we go. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Do we really believe that his yoke is easy and his burden is light? Do we really get that? Like, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that, okay, still. So what would happen if we said, wait a minute, Jesus is saying, I've been there. I had to set boundaries, and we're going to look at Jesus' life. Because when I was a human being, I couldn't be everywhere at all times like I could when I was still with the Father, right? Right? I was in a human body and I needed to sleep and I needed to eat and I needed to take a break from people and the demands. But here's the thing. That's what grace is all about. Grace is saying, let me show you how boundaries are a gift and they're, and they're a grace that shouldn't be abused, but that gets to be enjoyed. Does this make any sense this morning? How do we find that? So I've got two observations today about how to establish grace boundaries, boundaries of grace. And we're going to look at Jesus's life, okay, to do that. You with me? Let's pray. And then we're going to dive in. Jesus, I pray that this would be your idea, not my idea, that these would be your words and not mine. Father, that we would not just be hearers of your word only, but we would be doers who act and be blessed in our doing, Lord God, so that more people can come to know the good news and great love of our God. We pray all of this in your name, amen. So the first thing we gotta do is recognize, okay, that we need our people. You need your people, okay? If you're gonna set good boundaries, okay, you've gotta get your people. And here's the deal, okay? By getting your people, it also means that you have to maybe let go of the people that shouldn't be your people, okay? Sometimes that means giving up the people that you don't need to be, okay? Am I making sense? Because here's what Jesus does. Jesus is there. These are his his fellow, this is his fellow man. They believe in his name, and he says, but I did not entrust myself to them. You are not my people. But you know what he does do? Right before that, He starts to get his people. Let's go to the text. So if we jump back to John 40, it says one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Remember Peter from last week, the one who denied Jesus three times, but then went on to preach a message that helped to lead over 3,000 people to Jesus? Yeah, that guy. He first found his own brother, Simon Peter, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So I'd like to teach a little bit more theology today if I could, because I think it's good as we're kind of going through this to learn theology. It's a big word that means study of God. Okay, what, 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 what do we believe about God? 
the Jewish people, the Israelites in the Old Testament were given a book of the law. And if they obeyed these laws, okay, then they had God's favor. They had to earn it, okay? But when they had it, okay, they experienced an abundant life. They experienced community with God. And and part of that law also then included prophetic books as well later on. So there were these prophets, people that spoke on God's behalf, okay? And they predicted that one day a Messiah would come, a Savior would come, and he would put an end to that system and that he would pay the penalty for sin once for all. And he would establish a new law, a law of grace. Does that make sense? And once he comes, we believe in him, and now we're saved, and we don't have to work, and we don't have to earn. That's the Jesus life. So so here, Andrew is telling Peter, like, I think he's the guy we've been reading about. I think he's the guy that they said would come one day. He's the guy. So let's jump back into this story. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall now be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and Nathanael said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael, excuse me, Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. Isn't that how it goes? Hey, let me tell you. Let me tell you about Jesus. Ah, I don't know about that. Come and see. Have those conversations, but bring them, bring them. Come and see. Come and see. So Jesus is building his team. So Jesus is setting a boundary and he's saying, these are people that I want to entrust myself to. Okay, they're not perfect. We learned that last week but these are people that I am not going to entrust myself to. So why do we need the right kinds of people? Well, in Galatians 6, chapter 2, you've probably heard me preach this before. We read, share each other's burdens. Share each other's burdens. When you're going through something, okay, you can share them. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are burdened, right? And I will give you rest. Sometimes I think sharing the burden is helping that person get the burden to Jesus. Hey, I can see that that's heavy. Let me, let me point you to the person who's going to take it off your shoulders, right? Share each other's burdens. And then it says this, and so obey the law of Christ. Remember, Jesus came to say, now you don't have to obey all those customs and all those laws. Those prophets told you that I was coming. Now I'm here. I pay the penalty for your disobedience. You don't have to do anything to earn my love. Okay, that's the new law of Christ. So you actually are stepping into the law of Christ when you bear each other's burdens. And then it says this, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. And I think that that's where sometimes, okay, Um, when we talk about boundaries, we can fall into that category where we put ourselves first. Am I making sense? And we become too important. So we don't want to fall into that side of it. But we also don't want to think that we can do it alone. Because I like to do it by myself. Right? My daughter, man, I can do it myself. No, you really can't, but have fun. Let, you know, let her try, right? Austin says, I want to do it myself. Anybody anybody just love to do it yourself. I just, get out of my way. You just get out of my way. All right, I can do it. You're clearly incompetent. I'll take care of it. Right now, I'm just kidding. Come on. I'm just letting, I'm just, it's not right. I'm just saying it's real. Okay, there's a difference. Just because it's right. Okay, anyways. <clears throat> Sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's right. But you need your people. Now, you might be thinking, okay. You might be thinking, I'm all about boundaries when it comes to people. I might be a workaholic type individual, but I can definitely set boundaries when it comes to people. 
I don't need you, goodbye, right? Like some of you are that person, okay? I won't say your name. You already know who you are. Right? Yes, yes. You already know who you are. But listen, um, but you might be thinking, so, but why do I need to get other people? Why, why can't I just do it without any people? Like, wouldn't that be easier? Come on. Maybe you've been burned, you know? You, you've tried to entrust yourself to somebody. So this is where I'm interesting, okay? So I would definitely say I'm the work person. I'm the no boundaries person. I don't want to be soft, okay? Right, like that's like, I don't want to be the softy that doesn't know how to get things done. But I do love people and I'm very trusting. And I used to think that that was a great quality, but sometimes um, you can be too trusting. It's true. Sometimes you can be too trusting and you can let people in that don't need to be let in all the way. And that's why when I read that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like Jesus set a boundary and said, hey, you know what? Like, I can't do this with you. I can't go there with you right now. Maybe one day, but not right now. Not today. Um, I heard this quote from another church planter. He said, um, If you try to avoid Judas the betrayer, you may miss out on John the beloved. Let me explain that. One of Jesus's team, his people, ultimately betrayed him, got him arrested and taken to the cross, okay? Arranged his execution, essentially. But then one of them, was John. Yeah, the guy who wrote what we're reading this morning. And you know what's interesting about John? Throughout his gospel, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Isn't that interesting? He'll actually put that in the book. And some people might think, well, that's kind of arrogant, dude. Like, he loves everybody, okay? Like, why are you special, okay? I don't think he was necessarily trying to say he was special. I think for him, it was a reminder as he wrote it, like, Jesus loves me. I'm loved. I'm loved. And and maybe they had a special relationship. I'm not saying that, but I'm loved by Jesus. And, and And so what this guy is saying is, if you work so hard to shut everybody out so that you don't ever get hurt, you'll miss out on a friendship like that. Don't do it. Because I'll be honest, I have had my fair share of people that I've worked with in ministry, pastors, friends from my childhood, people that I thought had my back on a dime. Boom. Never what I thought. Just a couple weeks ago, I learned of another thing like that. Somebody, I found out, said something about me that wasn't true behind my back, and I thought, why would someone do that? And so what I've learned is, God, how do I do this? Because I don't want to become jaded, right? Especially not as a pastor and as a shepherd of people. I don't want to be that unapproachable person. Listen, that church is out there. You can go to that church where you can't touch the pastor and you can't know what he's up to and all that. Like, okay, I don't want to be that guy. But what I'm also learning, though, is I can't, like, be, I can't be everybody's best friend, and I can't tell everybody all my stuff, right? Like, I got to figure that out. Jesus figured that out. Hey, you know what? I love you. I'm here for you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you. But, but, like, I can't entrust myself to everybody. So how do we do this? Well, John, later in his life, wrote another book. Only this one is not a book necessarily. It's a letter. And he writes it to these Christians. And here's what he says in John chapter four, beginning in verse one. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. What's he saying there? Just because somebody says that they are a believer and they have the spirit of God and they're trustworthy doesn't make them so. He says, he says, test them. Test them. 
In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says something similar to his followers. He's sending them out to go tell people about the gospel, the good news. And he says, be shrewd as serpents, but gentle as doves. What's that mean? Be gentle as a dove, right? We know that we're called to be gentle and to be loving and to believe the best. But being shrewd as a serpent means you don't blindly just trust every single person you come in contact with, right? And so we have to find this balance. You know, I'm on one side of the fence and I've got friends that are on the other side of the fence and hopefully we can kind of work together to figure out how to find that middle ground. But it's hard. But it's hard. How do we do this? And then I love this in Romans chapter 7. Paul is talking, the apostle and church planner Paul is writing to this church. He's never been to this church. A lot of the churches that he wrote to were churches that he started or had already been in, but not the one in Rome. And he writes this. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. What's he saying here? There are things that I want to do that I don't do. How many can relate? And then there are things that I don't really want to do, but I do want to do them, and I do them anyways, but I know they're wrong, and I shouldn't do them. That's basically what he's saying here. This is the Apostle Paul, the church planter guy, right? the shepherd, the teacher, the apostle. And he is saying, hey, you know what? There are things in my life that I do that I hate and that are wrong. But you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't tell you what they are. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't tell you what they are. Why? I believe in that moment, I heard this recently, he was choosing to be authentic, but not necessarily transparent. See the difference? And so I've always believed that I have to be transparent and tell everybody everything that's ever happened to me and everything that I've ever done. But what I'm learning is that that's not always helpful. Am I making sense? And so that goes back to the boundaries. That's where the grace steps in to say, you can be authentic and you can be genuine and you do need to have your people that you can be fully transparent with. And I have those people, okay? But you've got to figure out where the boundary is. You've got to figure out where the boundary is. How do we find our people? We've got to discern. We've got to see them in action, right? Test the spirits, right? Test them. Jesus, okay, I believe because he was also God, had a little bit of a leg up on us, right? So he already knew what kind of person Peter was before he'd even physically met him, right? He already knew what kind of Peter, or excuse me, what kind of person Andrew was, right? So, We have to weigh these people against the word of God, right? We have to look at, does this person's character match what is consistent with the Bible? A lot of our uh, students right now are in relationships. It's awful, okay? They're all too young to be in relationships, I'm telling you, okay? I'm just, yeah, it's like stressing me out, okay? And one of the things that I've been talking to Wyatt about, and I know Wyatt is talking to them about is, like, What kind of person is this person? And most importantly, does this person have a relationship with Jesus? Because if they don't, like it's a non-starter. Like it's just a non-starter. It's just, okay. Is this the kind of person that you can entrust yourself with? Right? Uh, Is this somebody that's going to push you towards Christ? Are you growing in your faith because of this person? Right? You got to ask yourself those questions. Is this somebody that's in it for the long haul? This is kind of, I'm just going to throw it out there. Okay. You, we're trans, this is, this is off, I'll be authentic, transparent, whatever the word you want to use. Your elder team and your leadership team is under attack right now. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but um, every single one of our um, families and our elder team and in our leadership team has experienced some sort of pretty significant hardship or struggle this last month and a half. And it's all at the same time. And it's, it's been really hard, right guys? It's been pretty hard. 
And Tuesday night, um, you know, we didn't have groups. And I know you all think we party with, without you, but we don't. We met together and we prayed. Because Ed said, we're under attack, folks, and we got to pray. Right? And that's what you do. You, when Ed says to pr- do something, you just do it. Okay? All right? You don't ask questions. Okay? Um, and so we got together and we were just really vulnerable with each, with each other and just talked about here's where we're at. And Mark Carlton, he said, he said, um, Satan wants to break this group up. If he can get us broken up, okay, then, then the church can't, it's not going to work, okay? And he said, so we're not going to let that happen because we're our, each other's people. And then Kevin said, you're my people and I need you. I need you. And I'll never forget, Kevin, this was a couple years ago, we were on the phone and we were going through something really hard. Church planning is not easy, okay? All right, don't, if you're thinking about, I'm gonna start a church, just don't, just don't do it. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. If God wants you to do it, he'll make it work, but it's okay. And, and I'll never forget, Kevin teared up on the phone that day, that night, and he said, I am with you, not to be morbid, but one day you're gonna preach my funeral. I told him that's gotta be a long time from now, dude. Okay. Ed and Liz have got to make it to at least 200. I don't know. I mean, I, cause I'm making it to at least a hundred. So that's, that's my goal. So now, nah, you know, so, okay. But you got to find your people. And, and Jesus found his people. That's, and you know what? Here's why you need to find your people. Cause they will embody that grace we talked about last week. And when you're in the muck and you're in the mess and you open up, they're the people that say, I got you. But you got to test it and discern it. How are you going to do that, though, if you're never around anybody? Ah, right? So that's why, look around this room. Your people are in this room. Right? That's why we say we're a family. We're not just a family. We're a body. We're each other's people. That's why we push groups. That's, those are your people, right? So you got to get your people and you got to learn, hey, you know what? That's not my person. I've got to have that boundary. And it's not because you don't love them. And it's not because you don't, see, Jesus still loved them, cared for them, helped them come to know the truth. But he said, I'm not going to entrust myself to you right now. Second observation, once you get your people, you got to get your paws. Okay, you got to hit that pause button. Listen, I am not good at pausing. I don't like to pause. Anybody else like pausing sounds like not fun to me. I want to go, 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 right? That's me. But Jesus paused. Let's look at his life. Now we're going to go to Mark for a second, okay? So we're going to be in the gospel of Mark, chapter one, beginning in verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon, Peter, and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. You ever have that happen? If you're a mom, you know how that is, right? You disappear into your bedroom and all of a sudden chaos breaks out while you're trying to take five minutes. Where are you? Don't you love us anymore? You know, like it's like, right? Come on. And then you all end up just in their bed. Like you just end up in your mom's bedroom and it's like, and she's like, no, this, get out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, can I have one, you know, can I have one room? No, apparently not, right? Right. Like, Jesus is like, all day, right? People are coming to, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. And he's doing it, and he's doing it, and he's doing it. And then he says, you know what? He got away, okay? He got away, and he didn't just go take a nap. Though Jesus napped, we're gonna talk about it, okay? But he got away to pray. He got away to pray. But then, but then immediately, hey, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. See, Jesus knew that he had to get away or he wasn't going to be able to go back into the fight, right? He knew, okay, the reason why you pause and the reason why you set boundaries, 
okay, is not just to rest, but it's to restore so you can go back out and keep doing what he's called you to do, right? But then this is what's interesting. When they came to him, he said, let us go on to the next town that I might preach there also. See, if he would have stayed where all the people needed him all the time, he would have never left, right? Because there was always a need there. And he had to say, you know what? That's enough. That's all I can give you. That's hard for me. There comes a point in time where you go, I have given all I can give to you, but I've got to move on now. And and, and, And I believe because Jesus, okay, understood boundaries that they were a grace thing. When, when, when Peter came to him and said, everyone is looking for you, Jesus didn't feel bad because he knew he had given them enough. Does that make sense? I've given you what I can. I'm not going to apologize for getting away to be with my father. I'm not gonna apologize. We, I'm learning. I have got to stop apologizing for stepping back. You do too. And going, okay, I need to get time alone with my father. See, in the Old Testament, in the book of the law, the law of Moses, Moses, we don't have time for that. Look it up. Jay, you're about to hit it in Exodus, bro. He goes, I finished Genesis, I'm moving on. It's, it's about to get real, good luck. All right, no, Exodus is fun. It's Leviticus. I said, good luck with that. Let me know how you're doing. He goes, I'll let you know if I'm still a Christian after I read that. And I said, sounds good. <laughs> I said, fair enough. Uh, I said, that's fair. That's fair. I didn't get permission to share that. Sorry. He's like, whatever. Jay, Jay, if you don't know Jay, Jay doesn't care. He's going to tell you anyways. I don't care what you think. I need some of that. Okay, so anyways. Um, anyways, getting back to the point. Um, in the law, they had a day called the Sabbath day, right? So the Sabbath day was a day where they did not work. They rested. Okay, but in the New Testament, there's this whole book of the Bible called Hebrews, and it was written to help Jewish Christians understand that now they don't have to uphold all of those laws anymore for God to love them. They just need to believe in Jesus and do what he calls them to do. It was very, like, radical. Could you imagine growing up one way and then having a shift? It'd be like, Kind of being an atheist your whole life, or right, or 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 being, um, um, uh, you know, hin- you, you know, Hindu, or you know, maybe. And I've seen this. Okay, you grow up in these other cultures where it's all about earning and it's all about working, and then all of a sudden you understand grace, and it's like very radical, and it feels wrong to you because it feels like less work. It's because it is right. That's why it's called good news. And so he's writing this, and he says, "Hey, there's." St- There's no more Sabbath day anymore because we're not under the law, but there's still a Sabbath rest. You don't have to rest a whole day anymore, but there's still a Sabbath rest. Here's what it says. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Watch this. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works. Well, if there's not a day anymore where we have time off from work. If Sabbath is not a day, then how do we get Sabbath rest? Right? How do we enter into the Sabbath rest? What he's saying here is Jesus gives you the rest. Right? Because now you've put your faith in him. He's not really talking here about physical rest. He's talking about spiritual rest. Let me explain. Let's read it again. For whoever has entered God's rest, his grace, has also rested from his works or his grind. Are you picking that up? He's saying Jesus is your rest. When you put your faith in Jesus, it's not that you, it's not that that, that he gives you energy per se, it's that he's actually calling you to do less. He's saying you don't have to work anymore. It's Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He's saying you don't have to go back to the grind anymore. 
So part of your pause needs to be putting time in with Jesus because he is the one who's going to remind you that you don't have to work so hard. He's the one who's going to refuel you. He's the one who's going to give you energy. Am I making sense? You picking this up? Are you tracking? I know this is confusing, but it's really good. It's really good because when we get that, it changes everything. So that's why Jesus didn't just get away to nap. He got away to be with his father. Stay connected. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I tell this to the team a lot. Sabbath is when I remain in the master, not when I refrain from the mission. Sabbath rest comes when I spend time with Jesus and remember that he is my rest and that he gives me grace to keep going and that it's him working and not me. It's not when I just take my hands off the wheel and say, I'm not doing that anymore. Somebody else needs to do that. That's not grace boundaries. Does that make sense? But Jesus also did take naps. Matthew chapter eight, we see him sleeping in a boat, right? The the story though, the context is he was doing work. He was healing and teaching. There were a lot of people. They get in a boat to get away from the people, right? Jesus might've been an introvert. I don't know. I don't know. That would be interesting. What was Jesus's Enneagram? I'm going to get in trouble for that. Okay. Anyways, um, doesn't matter. Um, by the way, in case you're wondering, um, but he was asleep in the boat. He had physical limitations and there's grace for that. He had mental limitations and there's grace for that. Do you believe that there's grace for that? I struggle with that. In Psalm 127, two, we're wrapping up this morning. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Some of you aren't embracing a boundary of grace like Jesus did because you still work anxiously like it all depends on you. And you think that you're your provider and that you are your sustainer. It's got to be exhausting. It's got to be just so exhausting. What if we just got that he's our provider and that he's got our back? And there's more to life than money and there's more to life than busyness and what other people think of us and success and just like being. We're human beings, right? Not human doings. I love that. But then look at this, Ecclesiastes 3, 12 through 13. This is part of your pause. It's not just having your quiet time and reading your Bible. I know some of you thought maybe that's where I was going. So you want me to get good people around me, set boundaries of the people that I don't need around me, and then just have a lot of Bible study time. No, that's not what I'm saying. Because in Ecclesiastes, it says this. This is uh, King Solomon, Old Testament, uh, Old Testament king one of the wisest men who ever lived, rich beyond measure. He gets to the end of his life. He's had everything. He's seen everything. Every worldly pleasure has been his. And here's what he says. So I concluded that there is nothing better, this is in the Bible, than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor. For these are gifts from God. If you work and work and work, but you never take the vacation, if every week is an overtime week, why are you doing it? What's the point? Are you doing it because that's where you find your worth? You don't have to find your worth there. Are you doing it because you're worried you won't have enough? You'll have enough. It's not wrong to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Because then it says, these are gifts from God. Right? Ray is driving a fruit of his labor today. 
okay? And it is mighty fine. He got a new Corvette. It's a C8. It's beautiful. And I can't wait to take it for a spin. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? But can I tell you something? But can I tell you something? I'm going to out him right now. I'm going to out him, okay? He understands that that was a fruit of his labor, but he also fully, this man fully understands that it wasn't just a fruit of his labor, but he also understood that it's a gift from God. I know you know that. And I said, so did you trade in the other one? He said, no, I gave it away, right? Okay, just, I'm sorry. I know you probably didn't want everybody to know. He, okay, because, because see, that's this, okay? I know, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but Ray is one of the most generous people that I know. So do not feel guilty. I hope you don't. You, I don't think you do, which is good. Don't feel guilty about driving that Corvette right? I've decided to stop feeling guilty for enjoying the fruit of my labor. That's hard for me because it's grace, right? But it also means that I remember that it's all a gift. It's a gift. And some, sometimes our gifts look different. And that's what we need to remember. Our gifts can look different. So my encouragement to you this morning is to Find your people, set those boundaries, recognize it's okay to say no. We don't say no to God, but it's okay to say no. Get your pause, find that time to get in the word of God and spend time with Jesus. I have a new rule. If somebody comes to me and wants to talk, they need a counseling session with their pastor. My first question I'm going to ask them is, are you spending time here? Are you spending time in prayer regularly? If their answer is no, then my answer is come back to me after doing that for two weeks, and then we can sit down and talk about it. Okay? Because you have it. It's right here. It's right here. He's there. He's got you. Start there. Start there. And then get a date night on the calendar. Make it regular. Take the vacation. That's something that Ashlyn and I are looking at. We're, we're blocking out dates throughout the rest of the year. We're going to be gone here. We're going to be gone here. We're gonna be, we need to rest so that we can come back and we can continue to pour in. We got to get filled up so we can pour in. Jesus understood this. I learned about this. If you have an iPhone, I can help you. If you have an Android, I will pray for you. Um, but you can set these really cool, Kristen taught me this because she's got a lot of people that want her attention all the time. Um, you can set on your do not disturb. Have you seen this? You can, I got it on right now. Suckers trying to text me. Can't right now. I'm busy. Okay. <laughs> no, he did not entrust himself to them. Okay. Anyways. Okay. So, <laughs> no. Okay. Um, and you turn this on, and then it doesn't show you any of the nasty red dots like on your phone that, that show you all the, all the emails that you haven't read and all the texts you haven't read. They don't even pop through. They don't even come through. And then what's awesome, if you go to text me, it'll say, Alex has his notifications silenced. So you know, don't bother me. But then there's a little button underneath that that says, notify anyway. You better be bleeding, Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We will, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But you got to set those boundaries. I have been really enjoying like retro video game collecting. I've really gotten into it. I've got a hobby and I just, I just have been collecting video games. Matt, I got to show you some stuff I bought yesterday. It was bad. Okay. It was bad. See, Matt, Matt's lucky because his hobby is he collects firearms, but see, he's got this one up on me. Okay. Because anytime Jade, I'm, I'm outing him right now. Anytime Jade is like, do we really need that? He goes, can you really put a price on safety, Jade? <laughs> See, like, I mean, how do you, you know, I, it, right? Every time, like, I'm like, Ashley, can I buy this PlayStation? She's like, don't you already have one? You can't put a price on fun? I don't know. Like, I think you can. Like, you know, it doesn't really work the same way. But enjoy. It, they're gifts. They're gifts. That's right. That's right. That's right. 
So I hope this made sense and I hope this was helpful, but on his part, it's okay to set boundaries. Boundaries are a gift. They're, they're not a right, they're a gift from God because he says, I've got you and I want you to rest. I love you, church. I hope you've experienced the love of God in this place this morning and those of you watching online as well. Now go and extend it. We'll see you next time. Thanks.